tonight of introducing our speaker, um, a double pleasure. The first pleasure is that we get to learn about Southeast Asian history. This is a rare and wondrous opportunity. Um, Southeast Asia has something like the population of Europe, and yet in North America, for every historian of Southeast Asia, there's 34 historians of Europe. Um, I don't think the history of Europe is 34 times more interesting than the history of Southeast Asia. I think I'm going to be even less convinced of that after listening to the lecture tonight. Uh, so I'm very glad uh, about the region we're going to be spending the, the evening in. Uh, the second pleasure is that we get to learn from this particular historian of Southeast Asia. Eric Talia Kotso is Professor of History and Director of the Comparative Muslim, Muslim Societies Program at Cornell. He's the editor of the journal Indonesia. Uh, he wrote an award-winning Secret Trades, Porous Borders, Smugglings and States Along a Southeast Asian Frontier, 1865 to 1915, published by Yale. And more relevant to tonight's talk is The Longest Journey, Southeast Asians and the Pilgrimage to Mecca, published by Oxford in 2013, which traces the history of the Hajj from Southeast Asia from the earliest sources available to the present. Um, I recently heard a philosopher from Thailand who was visiting in British Columbia who was encouraging us to perceive processes rather than things. Uh, and I thought this was a very good motto that sort of sums up a lot of the direction of our speaker's scholarship. Uh, his monographs and the long list of the collected volumes he's edited traces smugglers, Muslim pilgrims, and Chinese merchants crossing straight state boundaries, scholars crossing the boundaries between history and anthropology, or a whole continent in motion in his recent volumes called Asia Inside Out. He's constantly training our eyes to see the processes of fluid movements across the borders of places and disciplines that we might have mistaken as solid, impenetrable things. His talk tonight is Remembering Devotion, Oral History, and the Pilgrimage to Mecca from Southeast Asia. Won't you join me in welcoming Professor Talia Kolso. Okay, so thank you very much for coming. I realize it's um, th Thursday, right? It's Thursday now, um, in the middle of the week still, so I'm very grateful that you took time out of your busy lives to come and uh, listen, and even more so because I realize Southeast Asia is not a, a big subject of study um, at SFU, and so I, I think it's really nice that people wanted to come and listen. And I also really want to thank um, the folks who invited me to come, uh, Daryl McLean, uh, Thomas Kuhn, who's in Germany today, and also uh, Ruth Fossey. Uh, it's very, very nice to be invited, so thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm going to present today about a book that I just uh, finished a couple of years ago. Uh, told you the title of that book, the, the Longest Journey, Southeast Asians and the Pilgrimage to Mecca. It's a book that tries to kind of write, to take an initial stab at thinking about uh, the history of the pilgrimage to Mecca from one large world region, and that's Southeast Asia. And I teach about Southeast Asia at Cornell. Uh, I'm a specialist on Indonesia, if, if, if you have to choose a country, but I don't actually like to choose countries. I'm, I'm much more interested in kind of regional approaches and global history approaches, which is something I know SFU has been very interested in with the kind of scholarship that's done here with the people that are uh, uh, around, especially in the history department. So I thought I would just give you a broad overview of what the book looks like um, with just a few slides, and then I'll pepper a few more uh, plates into the talk itself, too. Um, this is a book that looks at something called the long durée uh, of, of culture, economics, and politics. Long durée is a, is a term that a, a French historian named Fernand Brodel made popular in the middle decades of the 20th century. He was part of a school of historians called the Analystes, who talked about looking at long-term processes, and I'm, I've been very interested in that. Um, so, that first slide just gives you an idea of, kind of trying to look at these ideas of culture, economics, and politics of the Hajj over a long period of time. The book itself then really starts to get into the history of this incredible phenomenon, too, by looking at some of the first people who were going from Southeast Asia on the pilgrimage. We have records going back about 700 years uh, describing Southeast Asians making this uh, journey. It also talks about the colonial state, so you can see up there, uh, the colonial state gets very involved in this too. Southeast Asia is carved up in almost every part of Southeast Asia except for one country, Thailand, which was then Siam, uh, is colonized with 
different flags of different Europeans, so we have a lot of European records about this too. Um, and finally, it also deals with looking at the Hajj, the Southeast Asian Hajj, through a number of different windows. And I chose different windows based on the kinds of sources I was able to find. So one window was literary, it was looking at uh, uh, Lord Jim, Conrad's masterpiece, which is actually about a historical Hajj pilgrim shift from Southeast Asia that something happened to. I'm not going to tell you what happened to it, uh, uh, so I hope you'll still read the book. Uh, and because something happened to this one ship, 20 years later he ended up writing it and it, it ended up being his real masterpiece, I think, Lord Jim. Uh, so there's some of it looks at literary approaches. I also spent a lot of time learning about epidemiology, which is something I didn't know anything about, uh, because cholera also stalked uh, the pilgrimage to Mecca. Uh, then, as it does now, you, there are other diseases that have become important. When you have this many people coming together for any kind of common enterprise, you have to worry about disease, so there's a chapter about that. I tried to focus down sometimes onto specific people, and there's one person who I got very interested in, a Dutch Orientalist named Snuko Groni. Uh, Snuko Groni was the greatest Orientalist of his age. That's not a great title to have these days. Uh, uh, back then it was a great title to have. He, he really learned an incredible amount about Islam, about Arabia, but also about Indonesia, and I got very interested in his records which are almost entirely in Dutch, uh, and try to bring his uh, ideas to bear about the pilgrimage to Mecca. And also I got interested in espionage. Espionage is also a big part of this story. All of these Western powers were interested in the Middle East. They all had different reasons for this. Uh, they put forward different reasons uh, publicly, saying that they were interested in this, that, the other thing, philanthropy, making sure the pilgrims were okay, etc., etc. Some small parts of that were true. But if any of this has echoes with the modern day, um, that's because you're not hearing echoes in your head. It, it's, it's reality. These kinds of things were uh, going on for a long time. And just the last part of the book deals with what I call making the Hajj modern, pilgrim states in memory, uh, uh, thinking about what the effect of the modern day nation state has been on this most transnational of processes, the Hajj, uh, thinking about not just Hajis coming from the parts of Southeast Asia that are Muslim-majority countries like Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim country, even though it's far away from Arabia, but also countries like Cambodia and Vietnam and Burma and Thailand, where there are not Muslim-majority populations, but where every year Muslims undertake the pilgrimage to Mecca. Uh, I spent a lot of time with Hajj memoirs, which are written in Indonesian and Malay. Uh, going through hundreds and hundreds of memoirs of people who wrote about their pilgrimages. That's the second to last chapter. And the last chapter in the book is about oral history. Uh, it's called Remembering Devotion, Oral History and the Pilgrimage to Mecca. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. I can't have a prayer of trying to get all of this book into one lecture, so I'm taking one fourteenth of the book, one out of the fourteen chapters to try to just get that into a, a manageable 45 to 50 minute uh, talk. And it's this idea of oral history that I think is very important. In Southeast Asia, uh, there is a history to this. Uh, a scholar named John Smale in the 1960s wrote an article that is still used today. If, I, if any of my articles are used 50 years from now, I will be you know, beyond happy. I, I don't think it's going to happen to most of us. He wrote an, an article called On the Possibility of an Autonomous History of Southeast Asia. And this article is still, 50 years later, used by all kinds of Southeast Asians across the academy because it, it gets to the heart of the matter. When we're writing histories of people, whose records are we using? And in Southeast Asia, as I mentioned, Southeast Asia has been colonized by all these different European and, uh, 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 countries, all these different Western countries. Most of the record base for the last couple of hundred years is in Western languages, and it's from the eye of Western people. We want to get at what's going on for some of these processes that interest us for local people in a place like Southeast Asia. It seems to me that oral history is one of the ways to try to do that. Uh, there have been attempts to do this before. I'm not uh, inventing the wheel here. Uh, aside from John Smale and his autonomous histories, a scholar named Renato Rosaldo, used oral histories in the Philippines. 
Uh, in Vietnam, there was another fellow named Gerald Hickey who went up into the mountains to try to write oral histories of the mountain peoples in Vietnam. And actually, once we get in, even into the, into the 80s, there was a Japanese woman, Yamazaki Tomoko, uh, who went and found old Japanese prostitutes who had served in Southeast Asian brothels across uh, different parts of Southeast Asia, because there used to be actually thousands and thousands of Japanese women who worked in the colonial prostitution complexes of Southeast Asia. And she wrote a history of their lives. So there are people who have done this. It just hasn't been done that often, and I think it should be done more often. Now, my paper, my presentation today, is about the Hajj, or the pilgrimage to Mecca. Uh, and this, as probably many of you know, is the central religious event in the lives of millions of, of Southeast Asian Muslims who are required to try to make this spiritual journey at least once in their lifetimes. Southeast Asians have been performing the Hajj for hundreds and hundreds of years, and we have records about this. It would take me probably the rest of my scholarly lifetime and several other lifetimes if I were granted them to write just a history of the colonial Hajj from Southeast Asia. There's so much out there. Um, but I think you could try to write it up as one book, and that's what I tried to do with my Oxford book. Um, and just a part of it, just the very end of it, deals with these oral history narratives of spending time with Southeast Asian Hajis and finding out what they think of their Hajj. So starting in 2004, I put on a rucksack for a couple of months uh, every year, for <coughs> quite a number of years in a row, and I just disappeared uh, to talk to people in Southeast Asia about the nature of their pilgrimages um, to Mecca. The language of almost all of those uh, uh, interviews was in Indonesian or Malay, two languages that are very, very similar, although English was spoken in the southern Philippines, and um, I speak Chinese as well. I have to use Chinese in uh, some of the upland districts of mountain, uh, mainland Southeast Asia uh, for, Ch for Chinese Muslims who live in different parts of the region. Uh, men and women were questioned, old people and young people, rich people and poor people, Muslims living in towns and cities of various sizes and in rural areas as well. And the journey took me to a lot of different places. And I'm just going to put up um, some of the places here, because this actually got larger over time. Uh, and you can see it's not a nation-based study. It's a transnational endeavor to go across these spaces in Southeast Asia and speak to people in a number of different places. So the Muslim provinces of southern Thailand, all over Malaysia to a number of different places, Penang, Malacca, Kuala Lumpur, Kuala Trangano, Kota Kinabalu in Malaysian uh, Borneo, to Brunei, city-state also in Borneo, to Mindanao and Manila in the Philippines, to the high-rise um, HDB flats of Singapore, and then through a number of different places in Indonesia, in Palembang, South Sumatra, in Jakarta, the capital, in Java, in Banjarmasin, in South uh, Borneo, and to Makassar in Sulawesi, which is all the way out there. Uh, I also spent a fair bit of time in one place, a university called the University Islam Mantara Bangsa, or the, uh, um, the International Islamic University, which is in the suburbs of Kuala Lumpur in, in Malaysia. And I was able to talk to a lot of other Muslims from different parts of Southeast Asia there, uh, who, whose places I wasn't able to get to physically. And to just add in the green dots, this shows you the places, in addition to the red places, uh, that I ended up speaking to people um, and to try to find out all of this different information. And the result of all of this is to try to basically come to some kind of understanding about why, what do pilgrims remember about their Hajj. What aspects of this journey, which used to take months in a passage by sea, but now takes hours in a voyage by air, are worth remembering, and what things are forgotten? How do Southeast Asians organize these experiences in their memories? And what is cited as crucial to a Muslim life well lived? And what is incidental? Are material circumstances remembered as vividly as spiritual obligations? And what do various pilgrims' memories have in common? And perhaps most importantly, how do Southeast Asian Muslims explain to others and to themselves in the act of narrating experience? 
So these are the main things that I was trying to get at with all of these oral history interviews. It ended up being triple digit number of interviews around all of these different countries of Southeast Asia over almost a decade. Scattered months here, months there, every time I could get some time off from Cornell. Uh, winter breaks, summer breaks, when I was let out of my house to be, to be able to um, go and disappear and do this for a while. It wasn't easy, but it took quite a long time and it was kind of scattered. Uh, but after a certain amount of time, I was able to put together this material and I'm going to try to narrate it to you in three sections. The first is, I'm going to be talking to you about oral history memories that are trapped in a vault in Singapore. And these are tapes at the National University of Singapore and also in the, um, the archives of Singapore that look at uh, old pilgrims' memories that were put into audio form from 50, 60 years ago. The second part of the talk is going to talk about the material circumstances of what pilgrims remember about their journeys. And finally, the last part is going to try to talk about some of the spiritual, uh, um, spiritual memories of what people uh, actually narrate as part of their experiences. Okay, so let's start with these fossilized oral histories that are kept in a vault in Singapore. These are the oral history tapes that the Singaporean government has actually um, put together in trying to get narratives of all Singaporeans' experiences historically. They go back many different decades to the middle of the 20th century. They're all in vernacular languages, so either in Chinese, di various dialects of Chinese, they're in Tamil, they're also in Malay, some of them are in English. I was working with the ones that are in Malay, and I'm going to tell you about some of the transcriptions. I'm, I'm going to read some of them verbatim to you in English, though, uh, about the kinds of things that, that uh, what people remembered about um, the Hajj from uh, going all the way back to about 100 years ago when we actually figure in that the, a lot of the interviews were done about half a century ago about people remembering things going back to the early 20th century. So what are the kinds of things that people remember? Well, one of these fellows, Haji Ali bin Sirat, remembers the Middle Eastern influence that was coming to Singapore uh, on the sea routes uh, in 1912 via the pilgrims coming back from the Hijaz. So he th remembered things like songs and newspapers, Persian newspapers all coming off the ships and starting to become part of Singaporean life. Another thing that was remembered was Singapore's centrality as a kind of hard shipping depot. There were all kinds of spokes and radials and when we think about this, I'm going to just tie this into the places that I was going. I'm going to show you some of these places just to show you how central Singapore is. So this is pictures of the, the, the um, International Islamic Museum in uh, Kuala Lumpur. This is a place that was sending Hajis down to Singapore. Uh, eventually, people from Kuala Lumpur were going uh, on Hajj up to 100 years ago, even longer ago from Singapore. Um, you'll notice that I'm in some of these pictures, that's not because I love seeing pictures of myself. Um, it's because, unlike a card-carrying anthropologist, it took me a little bit longer as a historian to figure out that in the beginning, when I started doing these triple-digit number of interviews, um, I would ask people, can I take a picture of you? Because I didn't want to forget people's faces and the kinds of information that they were telling me. I could see people were uncomfortable about this. I thought, oh, that's, this isn't working. So then it switched after, after a little while to me taking, uh, me doing the interviews and at the end of the interview saying, can we take a picture together? And at that point, people would usually absolutely very willingly do that. So I end up being a lot of these pictures. And again, it's not because I love looking at me or I want you to look at me. You have to look at me anyway to do <laughs> today. But that's just the way I was able to get the interviews. And I, I think that's fair. We had shared something at that point for an hour or two hours, sometimes four hours, um, and there was a memory and I made sure to get pictures back to everybody. So this is the International Islamic University in Kuala Lumpur, but I also spent a lot of time in places like this. This is small Muslim villages um, and uh, some uh, cities in the Muslim parts of southern Thailand. Uh, you can see who I am next to all those old ladies in a, in a southern Thai village. These are Thai women who speak Thai, but they also speak Malay at home because they are Muslims. Uh, you see their heads are covered, and I'm about half a person taller than all of them. Uh, that's a famous mosque in Patani, uh, 
Uh, right around the time I was there, it was shot up by the Thai security forces because there's a lot of trouble between Thai Muslims in the South and the Thai government in Bangkok. Other interviews were done in places like Brunei, the home of the world's richest man. He changes uh, places with Bill Gates, I think, every year or something. I'm not sure who's in, who's in first these days, but um, Brunei was another place to go. And this is a travel agent uh, on the lower photograph who organizes Hajj tours for Brunei Hajis. Uh, it was also in places like Indonesia. The top picture is in the city called Banjarmasin in Borneo, the Indonesian side of Borneo, these kind of chocolate turbid rivers going up into the interior of Borneo with these little mosques uh, on the sides of them going into these places and speaking to people. The, the bottom photograph is in Palembang in South Sumatra. Uh, you can see the Chinese influence on the mosques there. So uh, you really get to see how widespread this diaspora is. And I'm going to show you two more plates for now. This is in Mindanao, in Zamboanga, um, in, the eastern, in the southernmost part of the Philippines. Again, this is a Muslim periphery in a non-Muslim state, in this case a Catholic state in the Philippines. These were Muslims that I was talking to in the various barangays. These are neighborhoods in Muslim towns in the southern Philippines. Um, and you can see also, just from the Muslims that are here in the photograph, how diverse people are. Uh, some of them with Chinese ancestry, some of them with Arab ancestry, some of them with Persian ancestry, but all of them, um, you know, uh, Filipinos. Uh, so you get a sense of how Singapore is at the center of this geographically, and all these people swirl through Singapore historically on their way to perform their Hajj. What are the other kinds of things that we get from the tapes, that these memories, these audio crackling, crackling voices in Malay telling us about what's going on 50, 60, 70 years ago for the Hajj from Southeast Asia? Well, another Haji, Haji Buang bin Siraj, remember, remembered his journey by sea in 1952. And his memory is so clear that I want to read it to you, the English, my English transcription of it, um, just now. In 1952, there was no air transportation, you see. We traveled for 14 days by ship. The ship was called Tindal Rise. The journey was hectic. There was no segregation of the passengers, which meant that everyone was treated equally. Each person is given a space of about three feet, basically just enough for one to sleep. The duration of the Hajj is about 14 days, but the journey alone could be between 18 to 20 days. I just had a calling to go to Mecca. Employees of the law firm I worked for were given $1,200 and two months of leave to travel anywhere they liked after working in the company for 10 years. Many of the employees traveled to Hong Kong and Australia. When my turn came, I thought that I would be wasting my money if I traveled to those places, as I didn't know anybody there. So I decided to perform the Hajj. When I told my parents I wanted to go for Hajj, they were shocked, as they had always considered me a nominal Muslim. And you can really hear this fellow's voice. He didn't know what to do with that money for serving for 10 years in the law firm. So he went on Hajj, and um, his family just didn't know what to, to do with that information. I, I like that uh, notion, because it's not always something that's a lifetime wish. Sometimes people just, just go. Uh, we also know from these tapes about industries that sprang up alongside the Hajj, the larger Hajj industry of sheikhs or pilgrim brokers that doubled, for example, not only working to get Hajis across the Indian Ocean from Southeast Asia to Mecca, but also as tailors. They would make skull caps for the Hajis. The Hajis would come back and wear a white skull cap. They would also make jubas and turbans. Another Haji, Abu Bakr bin Haji Abdul Halim, remembers that, quote, let me quote his own words here, when a person goes for Hajj, one would clean coins with tamarind water, and they will throw the coin and bras kunyi, or glutinous rice, towards the future Haji Haja before they leave the house. This tradition is called Sima Sima, which is Malay culture rather than an Islamic ritual. I saw this happening at one of my neighbor's houses. People board the ship at gate five. People spend the whole day at the harbor. They will re recite the prayers and wave the pilgrims off until the ship could no longer be seen on the horizon. So again, I'm arguing in this paper that when we think about the Hajj, it's not just a unitary Hajj. People come from different cultures. They may be a global ummah of Muslims that's over one billion people strong, but people come from separate cultures. They perform the Muslim rituals. Everybody tries to do the same things, but people come from separate parts of the world, and they have their own cultures and traditions uh, mixed in with all of this. 
Okay? Let's go to the second part of the talk and talk a little bit about what some of the memories of Pilgrim's when I was doing all of these interviews with something like 110, I think, altogether, 110 different people was about the long trip out. Uh, one of the hajis that I spoke to, a hajja, actually, an elderly Malaysian hajja, <coughs> told me about the hajj she performed in 1951 when she was a 10-year-old girl. So this is the memory, not only from half, from half a century ago of performing hajj, but the hajj is seen through the eyes of a child. And that is very uncommon to be able to get this kind of information. And the thing she remembered most was going on hajj, going to the docks in Penang, in Malaysia, going across the Indian Ocean, and two elderly people died on the ship on the way going over to Mecca. Uh, the captain called everybody on board, there were almost a thousand people on the ship, and the two elderly bodies were wrapped in sailcloth, latin sailcloth, and eventually taken and put um, over the side of the ship and into the water, and they had the stones there, so they sank. And what this makes me understand, too, since there's at least 700 years worth of Hajis going from Southeast Asia to Mecca, is that there's literally a line of skeletons across the Indian Ocean over all of that time of Muslims who didn't, didn't make it. You know, they might have made it to one side, but they didn't make it back. Uh, and that's something to think about, too. A Thai Haji told me also about the journey that traditionally Thai Muslims, because Thailand is a Buddhist country, and Muslims are the minority. Traditionally, Thai Muslims would go to Malaysia to perform their Hajj. They would go as part of the Malaysian contingent because Malaysia was much more organized for Hajj. Uh, but he said, now, these days, there's a lot of Malaysian Hajis who are actually crossing the border north towards Thailand to make their Hajj from Thailand. And I asked, well, what's the reason for that? And he said, it's just too complex. It's too organized, and there's too much going on for the Malaysian Hajj, so they try to come across the Thai border and go with our delegation instead. I had not prepared for that. A third Hajja told me about the journey. This was a Filipina woman who actually turned out um, was the only woman in the entire Islamic world, the year that she went on Hajj, that led a Hajj delegation. Not a single other woman led a Hajj delegation from anywhere else in the world except this woman the year she went. She was part of the royal lineage of Sulu in the southern Philippines. Tomorrow we're we'll talking with graduate students about the southern Philippines. Uh, this gives us some insights into the gender components of the Hajj. Um, again, it's very, very rare. It, almost all Hajj, national Hajj delegations are led by men. But when we come to Southeast Asia, uh, a paradise for studying gender. There's a reason why so many of the great works on gender in the, in the academy across anthropology, history, sociology are done in Southeast Asia. This is a part of the world where women have much higher status than in um, certain other parts of the world, at least historically. And we can see this in her words about this too. All of these arrangements, when we think about these together, show how the actual journeying of the Hajj mutates and adapts over time as circumstances change in the wider world. So sea travel becoming air travel. The, the flipping of borders when you're going to go from Thailand or Malaysia or back to Thailand and gender arrangements. A second broad memory that has to do with the material circumstances of, of the Hajj has to do with all of humanity's cultures coming together in a place like Mecca and Medina. Now, for us, coming from very multicultural societies like the United States, where I'm from, or Canada, uh, where, we're, where we are today, this is not such a, uh, such a strange thing. I mean, even just looking out into this audience, it's clear to see that people come from many different backgrounds. But a lot of people who are performing the Hajj, this is the first time they are going to be confronting people from all over uh, the world and from many different traditions. So I asked people, what, what was that like? A Filipina Hajat told me uh, a story about this that I thought was a, a really beautiful story. And she told me, you know, all Hajis and Hajas must go in national delegations. That's the way the Saudis organize it. You must come as part of a national delegation. But she found, coming with the Philippine Hajj uh, uh, group, which is one of the poorest groups, the Philippines is a very poor country, there was a young Chinese man who seemed to be flitting around at the edge of their group. And it turns out that he was from Xinjiang, from Western China, and he had not been able to get into the Chinese delegation to go on the Chinese Hajj. 
but somehow he had walked from Xinjiang, from Western China, to Pakistan. And this is just incredible. Have any of you been in the mountains between these places? This guy walked across the border somehow, got to Pakistan, managed to go with the Pakistani delegation, and then was taken care of by the Filipinos when he got to Mecca. Uh, and it's that kind of story that I think happens on a, on a much more common basis than we know. Sure, the Hajj is supposed to be organized through nation states, but people get there hook or by crook, uh, and they're gonna, if they're going to get there, they're going to get there. So that becomes clear too. Another Haji from Palembang, South Sumatra, told me a different story. He was 19 years old when he made his Hajj. When, by the time I talked to him, he was in his late 20s and was a uh, father of a young child. He told me that when he performed his Hajj, coming from Palembang, South Sumatra, he had uh, never seen Indians before. He had never seen people from India. Palembang is not a very cosmopolitan city. And the Indians that had, were coming off the plane, that were in a state of pre-ihram, that is, that they had not put on the white clothes of the Hajj yet, the women were wearing saris, so their midriffs were bare. And he, as a 19-year-old boy, man, was staring at all of these women and their midriffs, because he had never, in Indonesia, women do not bear the midriffs. They do not wear saris. And all of a sudden, he felt a sharp pain on his hand, and one of the Saudi police officers had taken a bamboo stave and smacked his hand and said, you're not here for that, Sonny. Um, <laughs> and I thought this story was very nice, too, because it really shows the humanity of the Hajj. This young fellow, 19 years old, we've all been there before, uh, uh, he was on Hajj, he knew he was there for religious reasons, but he, you know, he wasn't going to curb his humanity as part of that. Uh, he was just very curious. And finally, let me just tell you about a third Hajja, also who talked about this notions of kind of the multicultural masses that, they, that she found upon getting to uh, Mecca. She, this was the first time this woman from uh, the Malay Peninsula had ever seen Africans. And she was absolutely fascinated by looking at Africans, particularly West Africans and particularly women because many of the West African women had groove scars on their cheeks, where scarring is a form of beauty to, to make scars on your cheeks. They also wore these incredibly multi, uh, multi-colored garments. If you've seen women wearing traditional garments from West Africa, they're often a kind of riot of colors. This is before they're getting into their ikram clothing, the white clothes. Um, and this was something that you know, she had never seen before. She remembered this. And all of these kinds of descriptions of, you know, quote unquote, first contact are really part of the experience of the Hajj. And these memories often last a very, very long time. Of course, that gets us straight into a third question, which I, I think is a particularly American question. If you're seeing, you're being confronted by difference for the first time on such a large scale from many people coming from villages in Southeast Asia, is there racism or ethnocentrism on the Hajj? And I always got a similar response when I asked about this. It seems like such a particularly American question to ask because we have such problems with race relations in our country. I always heard, no, no, there's none of that. It's only a feeling of goodwill. Everybody is there together. We're all Muslims together. And somehow that did not sound right to me. <laughs> Just living in the world. Um, it may be that people feel that way, but is that really what people observe? So I would press and ask a little bit more and say, is it, did you never see any examples of racism or things like this? And after a time, I started to hear one answer that started to repeat itself numerous times. Several Southeast Asian women told me that they did, when pressed, yes, they, they did feel that there was some of this sometimes. And I said, well, what, how do you mean? They said, well, there's a lot of tramp, there's kind of shoving, pushing and shoving. In, in Indonesian, the word is kasar, kasar behavior, kind of acting in a coarse way. And I said, well, who is doing the pushing and shoving? And they said, well, you know, we're smaller. We're from Southeast Asia. So we are physically smaller than a lot of the people. And I said, well, who is doing the pushing and shoving? And again and again, I heard, and I'm just reporting this, I'm not making this up myself, it's the people from West Africa or it's the people from Afghanistan. And I don't know why it is that these two places were singled out by Southeast Asians. 
I mean, could they really tell the difference between Pashtun speakers and Urdu speakers? Did they know they were Afghanis and not Pakistanis, for example, or not Tajiks, or not Kyrgyz, or not something else? And if, did they really know they are West Africans and not Central Africans or East Africans? But this is the narrative that has developed in Southeast Asia. And I think that's interesting to why this should come about. A female Javanese pilgrim was much less understanding in what she told me. She was absolutely uh, disapproving of how she felt Arabs treated their women while on Hajj. And I'll just tell you exactly what she said in quotes. We do better in Southeast Asia, she told me. No man should ever be allowed to treat his wives or sisters in that way. He should be shamed. And again, this gets to the idea of normative gender relationships in Southeast Asia, which are often considered to be much more equal than in other parts of the Muslim world. A, a, a Muslim from Manila told me something else, and this was, uh, he remembered meeting a bearded Afghani man, and the man was smiling at him. They had no common language, and yet the man was still smiling at him. This was at the time of the wars in Afghanistan, when at the height of the wars in Afghanistan, they smiled, they hugged each other, uh, they managed to just talk through sign language, and he asked, are you okay? Is your family okay? These kinds of memories and these kinds of cross-cultural conversations, I think, are a big part of undertaking the Hajj. And these kinds of disparate friendships that are made during the pilgrimage can sometimes last entire lifetimes. That gets us to two last questions about material, material memories of the Hajj, and then I'm going to get to the last part of the talk about spirituality. Of course, talking about this uh, uh, ethnocentrism also has to ask us, make us ask, about the question of communication. Um, it seems very important in trying to understand the Hajj. How do all of these people speak to each other when there are three million Muslims all in Mecca and Medina at the same time? They're coming from 11 different Southeast Asian countries, not to mention all these other global nationalities, too. Is Arabic the most common lingua franca, or English, or Malay, or what language? And here, again, I heard many interesting things about how people manage to actually talk to each other. Thai Hajis, for example, told me that they have a lot of trouble performing the Hajj. Thai Hajis often do not speak French or English, and one of these large linking languages, and it turns out that many of them require the help of Thais who are working in Saudi Arabia on construction projects and other kinds of blue-collar labor that end up helping Thai Hajis who come from the Thai South by acting as kinds of translators for them because they just don't have a linking language. An Indonesian student told me uh, something else, and that is, look, a lot of this has to do with commerce. Because Indonesia <coughs> excuse me, is the world's largest Muslim country, their contingent as a percentage of population every year is the largest national group that is allowed to come to Mecca. So he said, it's in the interest of the shopkeepers in places like Mecca and Medina to learn a few words in Bahasa Indonesia so that they can try to sell their goods. This helps language along too. But I think it was the comments of a blind Malaysian Haji, a Chinese man from Johor, who had converted to Islam some time ago, whose answer made the most sense to me. He was deprived of his eyes, so he had to re rely on his ears for his entire experience of performing the Hajj. And he told me that he heard an altitude of languages, Malay, Urdu, English, French, Arabic, all kind of buttressing up against each other. If we think of what Babel must have sounded like, but Babel that actually works, Babel, a place that actually people are coming from all over and all of the languages are overlapping, this is probably what the Hajj sounds like not looks like, but sounds like. Finally, just the last thing having to do with material circumstances has to do with housing and health. There are really big differences in the ways that people perform their Hajj and how this looks in terms of housing and health. A Cham, Cambodian Muslim, told me, for example, he is, is one of the poorest delegations coming from Cambodia, that they were staying 45 people to a room in apartment blocks and that there was a large amount of airborne disease that was actually exchanged between the pilgrims. A different Indonesian man from Aceh province in North Sumatra told me the same thing, that flu spread through his Hajj contingent. 
Uh, the rituals were very tiring, and these Indonesians were staying something like two to three miles away from the holy sites, and they had to walk. So every day, walking in the heat, he said it was very, very difficult to perform their rituals because they were staying further and further away than many other pilgrims. They were exhausted by the time they were uh, at the holy sites and performing their, their rituals. Yet Singaporean hajis told me that they were staying in the Hilton Hotel and Swiss Hotel, and so were hajis from Brunei. So from these smaller, wealthier, better organized countries in Southeast Asia, these people were performing hajj, and I make no value judgment whether their hajj was better or worse or anything else like this. It just was more comfortable, and I think we have to acknowledge that as well. I'm going to just launch us into the third part of the talk. This is the, uh, the official magazine of the Malaysian Hajj, which is called the Tabung Haji, is the organization that actually organizes the Hajj from Malaysia. Uh, you can see that this is a, you know, it's a glossy magazine. It's for all Malaysian Hajis who are going. They have an idea of what they're going to do through these magazines, and it's, it's really well, well funded, well organized. Uh, the state is involved as well. This is a map of the Indonesian Hajj camp in Arafat, the plain of Arafat, and it shows you how Indonesian Hajis, again, the world's largest delegation every year, because of it's a percentage of population, are spread across uh, you know, a vast part of the plain of Arafat, and they know which tents are going to be theirs. And this is uh, advertising from a Singaporean Hajj agent, uh, TM Fauzi. I, got, I spent a lot of time with this guy finding out how his business works for getting Singaporean pilgrims to, uh, to Mecca. And you can see everything is delineated, what food you're going to eat, what kinds of buses you're going to take, is there a doctor, uh, all these different things. You can see how the state gets involved. If you happen to be a pilgrim coming from a wealthier, uh, better organized state, you're going to probably have an easier time. And finally, just about translation, you can see how the prayers themselves are translated from Arabic into, uh, into uh, uh, a Roman translation of the Arabic, so from Arabic script to Romanized Arabic, and then eventually into Bahasa Indonesia, too. So the pilgrims see the prayers. If they are not able to read Arabic, they can actually sound out the prayers in Arabic using the Roman letters, and then they understand the meaning of the prayers by having the Indonesian at the same time. It's quite, quite complicated. Let me just end the talk by talking a little bit about some of the spiritual memories of Hajis I talked to. And again, this is all across Southeast Asia uh, and um, across a wide amount of space. The first question that I asked in almost all these interviews were, was, you've performed your Hajj now, are you going to try to do it again? And a Brunei, a Brunei Haji told me something that really stuck with me in this. He told me about a calmness in his heart that he felt only while performing the Hajj. And the, the term in Malay is very beautiful, Tanam di Dalam Saya, about there's a calmness that you can only get while performing the Hajj that will not exist with you for the rest of your life. Other pilgrims wanted to perform the Hajj for relatives of theirs. They wanted to come back to do it for somebody else. You can actually perform the Hajj not for your own spiritual blessings, but for those of others, people who have disease or are, are infirm or unwell and cannot go people who are very old, and you want to make sure that they are going to have a hajj attributed to them before they pass away. You can even perform the hajj for someone who has died, if you have stated this intent before you go. So people do make these decisions to go. A third person, a Filipino hajj, told me that in fact, it has nothing to do with how wealthy you are, how many hajjs you are going to make. She said there are poor people who go on hajj over and over and over again. They manage to find a way and there are rich people who almost never go on Hajj or, or make no decision to go on Hajj. So although Islam only states that performing the Hajj is incumbent upon every Muslim once in their lives, so long as their monetary resources permitted, a return to Mecca is usually seen by Muslims as an inner decision, rather than a voyage dictated by one's material circumstances on earth. This made me ask, well, if you're going to be performing this Hajj, what were the spiritual highlights of going on this incredible voyage? And I heard a number of different things about this. A general answer that I got from a number of different women, and again, it speaks to the gendered nature of the Hajj, 
was that actually for a lot of women, going to Medina was much more important than going to Mecca. And I said, why? They said, going to the Prophet's mosque in Medina, women have a special place in this mosque. And what they do is that they will, they will make a cordon by holding hands with each other. And then a sister, whether she's a real sister or not, one of the women will go into the middle of the cordon, be protected by the other women holding hands, so the woman is not buffeted by the crowds, and then she can perform her prayers, the salat. She can kneel down and perform her prayers while there's a cordon of women uh, that are with her. Uh, and this is only done for some reason in, 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 in the mosque in Medina. I thought that was very interesting. A second answer I got about what was the most important place that you went to had to do with the plain of Arafat. I heard this again and again from people. This were the pathways of Muhammad's actual life. He was in this place on the plain of Arafat. This is the place where the word of Allah was delivered. Many Southeast Asians had never ever seen a desert. They come from one of the wettest places on earth. It's a monsoon climate, it's jungle. They've never seen what a desert looks like. So to go to one of the world's harshest deserts, the Arabian desert, and see this is very, very moving. But the main answer I got about what was the most important place to go was undoubtedly the Kaaba, right? The great stone structure in the middle of Muhammad's mosque at the center of Mecca. Pilgrims were constantly moved to tears in telling me about their first experiences in circumambulating the Kaaba in their initial <coughs> journeys to Mecca. I felt clean, one man told me, for the first time in my life. I was crying. Most people were crying, another woman told me. And if they weren't crying, I knew they were crying on the inside. I'm going to just finish with three last questions that I asked about the spiritual dimensions of the Hajj. One of them was not a question I had uh, put into my uh, list of questions that I wanted to ask, but I started to hear things about this again and again. So I finally ended up putting this question in about halfway through, the, through, the, through my uh, experience doing interviews in Southeast Asia. This has to do with signs and wonders. I had not planned to ask anything about this, but again and again I heard things about strange manifestations that people saw while they were performing their Hajj. The faces of long dead friends or relatives appearing to them while they performed the circumambulation of the Kaaba. Children who had died five years ago. Neighbors who had died 10 years ago. Grandparents who had died 30 or 40 years ago. People would turn around while they were doing the circumambulation of the Kaaba in these incredible crowds and turn around and see the faces of people they knew that suddenly would appear. One Filipino haji told me with tears streaming down his face that he turned around and saw the faces of cats. I said, cats? Why cats? He just kept crying and he said, it's because when I was 10 years old, me and another boy stoned a cat in an alleyway in the Philippines. And I've always, my whole life, I've thought about this. Why did I do that? I was 10 years old and he was circumambulating the Kaaba and he saw the faces of cats. One other person told me, and I just cannot explain this, so I'm just going to let it lie for itself, that he turned around in the middle of the circumambulation and saw the face of a pig. Others told me about strange cloud formations, swirls, incandescence, vague shapes and forms over Mecca, how to explain these, and still others told me about medical miracles. A Brunei Haji told me that he brought his son, his teenage son on Hajj, and he thought it was going to be the last time that he was gonna be able to spend time with him. He had been diagnosed with a brain tumor. The best doctors in both Brunei and Singapore had not been able to heal him, but the boy came back he had some of the water from the well of Zamzam, and miraculously, and the doctors could not explain this, his tumor started to shrink. This was what it was explained to me. Now it's easy to dismiss this kind of explanation to stress, to exhaustion, to spiritual ecstasy, but I heard this kind of thing again and again and again, in different forms and in different tellings by different hajis. And I had never thought to ask a question about these kinds of experiences, but the memories were volunteered at the ends of a number of interviews in a row, and always in hushed tones, so that I began to ask about these experiences more and more as I started going through uh, my travels in Southeast Asia. 
Let me get to the two last questions and then I'm going to stop, uh, hopefully right on the hour. I wanted to know if pilgrims felt closer to Islam for having uh, performed the Hajj. And I expected quite a clear answer to this. Of course Muslims are going to feel this way. I reasoned that they had spent several years saving up the money for this. Um, how could they feel any different than to feel closer to Islam? And one haji uh, didn't disabuse me of thinking that this was a stupid question. He said, that's ridiculous. Of course they're going to feel closer to Islam. How can they not feel that way if they are performing the rites in the right way unless they are doing things that are haram, that are forbidden? Of course they're going to have to feel closer to Islam for doing this. A Kalantanese Muslim, a Muslim from the eastern coast of Malaysia, told me that the desolation of Arafat, uh, seeing what Muhammad had gone through in his lifetime, that this was the kind of thing, this kind of suffering, made him a better Muslim. Because he finally realized what was at the center of his religion. But I think it was the words of an Indonesian haji who told me something much more prosaic that made me understand uh, what a lot of people felt about this. His group had flown in all the way across the Indian Ocean from Indonesia, they had landed in Mecca, and they were one of the last planes that came in that went to Jeddah, to the, the city that uh, leads to Mecca. That's where the airport is. But it turns out there was just a huge traffic jam of all these hajis trying to get, all these pilgrims trying to get from Jeddah into Mecca that night. It was already 3 o'clock in the morning. He was sitting in the bus. He was exhausted. They had flown across the Indian Ocean. They had been up for you know more than a day already. He was like, when are we going to get there? There's just there's nothing to be done. And it was at that moment that one of the Saudi security officers opened up a side road, and their bus was able to go in front of all the other buses in this enormous traffic jam from Jeddah to Mecca. And it was at that moment that they were able to get into Mecca, and they were not going to have to wait any longer. A Malay Haja told me that the pilgrimage should impart exactly those kinds of lessons in bringing one closer to one's faith. God, give me inspiration. How do I deal with myself? And it's through these kinds of experiences in the Hijaz that pilgrims pull themselves closer to the core teachings of Islam and then live them more regularly as a part of their post-Hajj experiences when they return to their own countries. And it's that last thought, did performing the pilgrimage make you a better Muslim, that always served as the last question in my questionnaires. Was it all worth it, the pain and suffering and privation the ill health, the discomfort of the journey, and the years of scrimping to put pennies away, all for a month-long journey that would quickly fade in one's thoughts as the pilgrim got older, because memories always fade, even memories of the divine. I was hesitant to ask this question. It seems so deeply personal. And why should anyone give me an answer to this one way or the other? But the pilgrims did answer. And I want to just finish with these answers. An Achenese man from northeast Sumatra told me, you can't come back unchanged from your Hajj. There are expectations now about your behavior. The symbol is the white pechi, or songkok, the white cap that you are going to be wearing in your everyday life now in your community. You have to show that you are a better Muslim. Another man told me that there is special pressure now to really perform the, 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 the aspects of Islam that show you are a Muslim. You must pay the zakat, the tithe, once you have come back from your hajj. You must really fast now during Ramadan and not kind of cheat a little bit here and there uh, just because it's going to make you feel better. You really must pray five times a day now uh, when you come back. So I think this was an idea that uh, came across to me from many of these Muslims that they were going to come back and they were going to make a covenant with themselves to become better Muslims. But I want to end with the answer of one woman who told me something that I'll never forget. This Hajjah looked at me quietly for a moment and chose her words very carefully when I asked her that last question. Quote, I think proximity to God comes at low and high ebb, she said, and the Hajj does not necessarily affect that union. It's a little worse for me right now, unfortunately, though I have indeed been to the holy cities. So the answer to your question about whether I am now a better Muslim is, not necessarily. What is important, though, is finishing that fifth pillar. I still have a lot of homework to do to get closer to God.
Thank you for listening. To anthropology or oral history interviewing, because I'm not. I, I have, a, as I've tried to say, I have a lot of learning to do along the way about photographs, about what kinds of questions people will respond to. Um, it's trial and error, yep. a lot of trial and error, and it's also, I think, getting people to believe, which is not always easy as an American, as opposed to being Canadian. Even though you know our English is almost the same, uh, uh, we share a very large uh, undefended border. It's really different to be an American in the world than a Canadian. And a lot, of, some of, some amount of this interviewing was done during the times of George W. Bush and not during the times of uh, Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, so it was really difficult, especially during that time. When Obama became president, it was easier. Uh, it was noticeably easier to walk around and ask questions about these things. When you spoke to them in Malay, did that help break the ice? That helps a lot, yeah. Speaking a language really makes a difference. And I don't speak all of the Southeast Asian languages. No one does. You can only learn so many languages. But speaking a language of scale, like Indonesian or Malay, which is useful not only in, it, in Indonesia and Malaysia, but also among ethnically Malay communities in Singapore, Brunei, the southern Philippines, southern Thailand, that's a language of scale, so it's, it's a very useful language. That really helps, and it really helped, especially in the southern parts of places like Thailand and the Philippines, where if you come in as a researcher speaking Tagalog and Thai, I think you'll have a much harder time speaking to Muslim populations. If you can come in and speak a language that they see as ethnically their minority language, I think you have an easier time doing this kind of research. And in those two places, which are both conflict zones, I came in with all kinds of vouching. I had people vouching for me, you know, this guy is not a CIA agent, he's not, you know, someone coming to ask these questions for other reasons other than academic reasons. Do you see a difference between speaking to people of moral land as opposed to Singapore? Yeah, people are much, much more careful speaking to you in a conflict zone. In Singapore, um, the only uh, caution I felt was speaking to you with knowing that the government might might be, you know, how would the government feel about you saying anything, but Singaporean hajis had very, very little to complain about with their hajj, and they knew this. I mean, they, they were really well taken care of by the Singaporean authorities. Um, so they didn't say critical things. It's possible that they might feel some critical things and they didn't say it, but they probably looked around and saw that their hajj was extremely well organized compared to people coming from poorer countries who had you know, much greater challenges to deal with. Um, but yeah. Mr. Bjorko? I was wondering if you could comment, you talked about most Muslims feeling that they came out a better Muslim uh, so long as they didn't so do something haram during the thing, and I was wondering if you could comment on narratives of sin or narratives of haram. Uh, of Haram, which must much of it occur. Do people do, do people confess to, be, to sexual indiscretions while on Hajj, pickpocketing one while on Hajj, or neglecting ritual, ne neglecting right. ritual prayers? Like, right. I was wondering if what yeah. what the story on that. Well, right, you've hit it right on the head. I mean, while you're performing Hajj, you are not supposed to be sexually active. You're not supposed to wear perfume. You're not supposed to do a number of different things, uh, and. That is taken seriously. If you end up doing these things while you're on your Hajj, somebody will say something to you. Uh, and I think internally you will say something to yourself. I know I'm not supposed to be doing this. And there's a number of different things that are involved in that. Um, I don't think anybody, you can be a very good social scientist, and I'm not claiming that, but I don't think anybody is going to admit to you, you know, I was pickpocketing while I was on the Hajj. Uh, I, I, that's the first I've ever heard that question. Uh, and nobody ever said something like that to me. Um, I think, you know, there's probably not an awful lot of that. Um, there might be some of it, but I don't think there's an awful lot. People take this seriously, and especially if you're saving for years and years and years, and you're coming from a third of the way across the planet to do it, people, people want to be there for the right reasons, I think. What about complaints about other people? Well, there were some, as you heard, and it was that's what's interesting, and I, I try to be very careful to say, I'm not saying that West Africans and Afghanis are, are the people who push, but I heard this again and again. So I think it's become a narrative among Southeast Asians that these are the two groups that do this, but as I was asking, 
would, would the average Southeast Asian be able to tell an Afghan apart from a Pakistani? You know, would they be able to hear differences in Pashtun and, and, and Urdu? I don't know. I think probably not. So I don't know why this narrative has come around, but I've heard that again and again and again in, in interviews in scattered places. So clearly it's become a trope. It's become a narrative. Um, whether there's truth to it or not, I, I don't know. I can't go to Mecca. I'm not a Muslim. So I would have loved to have gone to Mecca for this project, but, and I can't tell you how many times people encouraged me to go, <laughs> including Muslims said, oh, just go, come on, you gotta go, you're writing a book about it. But, you know, this isn't the 19th century, I'm not Richard Burton, I can't go if I'm not allowed to go. Um, so. um, I, I am Muslim, yes. and I did the Hajj with my family at age 10, so when right. you pass that story about the lady with her memories of 10, um, and a few years ago in 2011, I performed the Umrah, the minor pilgrimage. Right. Um, there is... Uh, 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 a realization with Muslims that when you have not been to Mecca it calls to you and once you have been it always calls you back so having done the Hajj at age 10 I always had this longing to go back and having gone back I still have this longing to go back um, so my question specifically is about encountering people in Southeast Asia who have not uh, done the Hajj but maybe could afford and have done the Umrah, right. the minor pilgrimage, yes. and what about maybe one or two of those stories or memories that you came across? Sure, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, there are, I did speak to lots of people who went on Umrah, and Umrah is cheaper, you can do it any time of year, you don't have to do it during the Hajj season, which is a lunar, arranged according to the lunar calendar, but the blessings that are accrued, are, as you will know, are not considered to be as large as for performing the Hajj. And in Islam, you are, expe you are expected to go on Hajj once in your lifetime if you can afford it, if you have the resources to do it. But what a lot of people do is they go on Umrah because that's more realistic. A lot of people, especially in Southeast Asia, are poor. They can't really hope to save the kinds of money that is going to be required to go on Hajj. Um, so they go on Umrah and that they say that is the kind of blessings I'm going to be able to accrue for this. Um, there's also an entire tradition in Islam of ziyara, of going to the tombs of saints, which also accrue spiritual, spiritual benefits, and you see this across the Muslim world. Some places we know, right, uh, some of the folks in West Africa, Boko Haram, and some of these other groups, that they've been particularly active in trying to destroy the tombs of saints, because they see this as kind of accretions to Islam that are cultural and local, that are not part of Orthodox Islam. But it's widespread in the Islamic world, the, the, the notion of saints. Um, just like it is in the Catholic world, right? Just like it is in, in many different religions. So it's a decision that people make. Uh, it's a financial decision. It's also a decision based on how much of their money they're going to put aside for something like this when it becomes very difficult to do it. Um, I you know, encountered a certain amount of scorn and skepticism for spoken to me about from certain Muslims about you know for example movie stars in Indonesia who go on Hajj or politicians who go on Hajj and make a big show of it about how pious they are and then they come back to their own countries and they still act like you know spoiled terrible people um, so you know and actually in Indonesia there's a there's a term for this you call someone who talks a lot about having performed their Hajj but comes back and still acts in venal terrible ways, you call them a Haji Singapura. <laughs> they got as far as Singapore, but that's it. Um, and it's a particularly kind of snub that I really like, um, because it, it lets people know where they stand. Um, if you're called a Haji Singapura in public, that's, that's a pretty bad insult. You know, it's usually reserved for private. <laughs> Mr. Wiesenthal? Yeah, I'm uh, really intrigued by your discussion of Haji's experience with deceased relatives and with animals. Yeah. Um, in my approximation, the Haji is, is divided <coughs> in several different ways um, about how to interface analytically with experiences like this that appear to challenge or even transcend the <coughs> confines uh, of the categories that historians and anthropologists attempt to use um, to sort of explain or make sense of them. So, um, 
I mean, I would encounter a lot of debate in terms of how one should ask about these things, yeah. and especially about how one should write about them. So I was curious, um, because, because you said that you, you sort of added this question after yeah. hearing um, these ex experiences first. Yeah. So I'm curious about the terms in which you used to ask about it. Hmm. I mean, like, did you say something along the lines of you experienced something supernatural? I mean, I, I really don't know what you'd ask. And then in terms of um, the responses you got, like how did people themselves characterize what that was? And then in terms of integrating this sort of thing into like scholarship, right. how do we narrate that? Yeah, that's a great question. It's an important question. I mean, the, the way I phrased it was um, not supernatural. Mm -hmm. I used the word, did you see anything you can't explain? Um, that, or that's not explainable. And um, as I said, and as you just said too, it wasn't a question I had originally thought of, but I started to hear these things again and again, and I started thinking, I need to ask about this because something's going on here that I don't understand. Um, can you, did you see anything that you can't explain or that is not, it's not part of our normal experience? And people would, you know, not every person would tell me about this, some people said something, some people didn't. Some people didn't say something at first, but then later on in the day, we, after the formal interview was done and I was still hanging around, they would say, oh, you know, I forgot to tell you about this one thing. I can't really, I don't know why, but I can't really explain this. I saw this, or this thing happened. And I'm not passing a judgment on this one way or the other, as, as you were saying in a very halus, a very refined way. Um, <laughs> It's, it's problematic, right? You know, what, what do we do? You're, you're writing as a social scientist. I'm, I'm as an academic. Um, but, you know, I think you give people agency. That's what I try to do. Um, give people agency to tell their own stories in the way they want to tell it. Um, and don't make a judgment, you know, about the, the brain tumor story of the Brunei Haji. You know, this was an old man telling me this. I, I didn't want to say, can you explain how that tumor shrunk to me from the Zamzam water? because I don't think he can explain that to me. Um, but I, I don't want to say that that's not true, because what do I know? I'm not a doctor either, and I'm not, a, I, I'm not any of these things. I just, I'm just recording it, and then other people will make of it what they will. Um, so yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Did, you, did you not hear of any deaths at the Hajj? I yeah. have an Egyptian friend who died, and his earlier his mother died on the Hajj. Yeah. And it's considered a blessing to die Absolutely. on the Hajj. And another thing, aren't healings commonplace at Hajj? Aren't what? Commonplace? Healings. 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 Yeah, Hajj, to go on Hajj and die while you're performing the Hajj is considered to be a blessing. So the fact that there is this line of skeletons across the middle latitudes of the Indian Ocean, um, I mean, literally, that exists. No one has seen it, but uh, it must exist because it's happened thousands of times in historical time. Uh, that is considered to be a blessing to, to, to die while on Hajj. And most people will not feel, um, most religious people, I think, will not feel badly that this has happened. In fact, the spiritual blessings accrued are supposed to be larger. And about healing on Hajj, that, that is interesting. I mean, Zamzam water is traditionally thought to be healing. The, the, those, those two especially, I mean. Yeah. And I meant dying right at the Hajj place, not on the water at the Kaaba. I haven't heard personally about anyone who died at the Kaaba, but I'm sure it's happened. I'm sure it's happened. Heard them now. <laughs> yeah, I have. Yeah, now I have. You're right. Um, from you. I mean, that's quite interesting. Uh, you know, there are so many people going, three million people, and traditionally a lot of the people going have been elderly too, because it's important to get the Hajj in while you're still alive. Um, so I'm sure it's happened many times. If you think about the heat, the stress, the dislocation, you know, all, all of this happening, I'm sure it happens on a regular basis. And in the historical records, we can look and see, I've written some, some stuff about this, about what happened to these people's bodies, to their belongings. The colonial states got involved in this and in kind of remitting um, things back, back to the Indies, for example, the Dutch had to figure out what would happen to a, a Haji's possessions when they died on the Hajj. It had to go back um, in ships back to the Indies, but who was going to pay for that? So there were all kinds of discussions about this. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, in my childhood memory, 
I used to read this um, explanatory book about all those like ritual structure and like oh, and pictures of like if you go this you do this if you go this do this it, it was a sick book and my grandma just gave me money to like read it for her over and over again oh. even I got like almost memorized everything I just read it for money yeah. but after she went to Hajj and come back a lot of her memories are kind of like connected to that book and like oh you said right like yeah. I saw this I did this like yeah. yes if this happened like we did this so my question is like where did you grow up by the way sorry Xinjiang in Xinjiang yeah okay. so my question is there are a lot of like books and even now or like video tutorials or like like documentaries that give you lots of knowledge about this ritual structure and uh, uh, the journey before people go and yeah. perform it. So like how <coughs> those like preparation and those knowledge structure reflect on their like memory after the program? Yeah, that's a great question. And that it's it's true that there's a huge industry for this now in many different languages. So I'm able to read the ones in, in Indonesian and Malay. I don't know if yours were in Chinese or in Uyghur. Uyghur. Uyghur, yeah. So that's interesting too. Um, I think it does help shape the expectations of a pilgrim as to what they think they're going to find when they perform the Hajj, and it's important. So there's an entire publishing industry for this, and also the Hajj bureaus get involved in this as well um, to try to tell uh, their their citizens from their own countries what to expect when they get there, what to do, what what are you supposed to do, and some of it is spiritual. You know, about what, what prayers you're supposed to say, the salat, all of this kind of thing. But some of it is not spiritual. Some of it is just about day-to-day -day things, like what do you do if someone <coughs> takes your money? Or what, what do you do if someone puts their hands on you and you're a woman? You know, or all these different kinds of things. It becomes really a, a kind of day-to-day -day primer for what to do while you are on the Hajj. Um, and does this kind of eventually mix together with people's actual memories of their actual uh, uh, lived experience in the Hijaz? That that is a really great question. Somebody somebody should write something about that. Um, yeah. Can I just ask one question? Um, I think it's no longer the case that once upon a time there was some hesitation about oral history because people's yeah. memories are shift or have a lot of movement uh, in a way that written sources maybe don't. Um, I was just wondering if you had any problem. It, it seems like what you're doing is mm, really in response to the question about the supernatural. You were you said giving agency to the people. You seem to be presenting what they're saying, and you're either not evaluating it for truth or you're saying that I'm not evaluating it for truth. Um, does that take care of the problem of the possibly falsified or false nature of these memories? Yeah, I'm, what I'm saying is exactly that. I'm, I'm taking their memories at, at face value and, and writing it into the record. Whether it's true or not, what they're telling me, I don't know. What I think, you know, <coughs> excuse me, what I think scholars have become more comfortable in saying is that oral history is, is just another way of getting voices into the record, it's, it's, no wor it's no better, no worse than archival data in certain ways. In other ways, you can make value judgments on this. I mean, would you rather have a document from the 1890s or would you rather have someone telling you, well, three generations ago, I remember hearing that my great-grandfather did this. I mean, I would say you probably want the document from the 1890s, but oral history gets other kinds of thoughts into the record too, I think, and it also gets self-perception into the record. A lot of the records themselves, except for you know smaller amounts of material in this case, much of the record, if, when we're getting back that far, is, is written by colonial servants. And they had their own agendas. So that, that material, even though it is temporally, it fits better our idea of what good evidence should be, it's already suspect in certain ways uh, for other things. So. There's no such thing as a perfect record. I think what we do as historians, you tell me your opinion on this too, is we try to cobble together many different sources and say, well, look, this is the best picture I can give you based on this, that, the other thing, and, and that over there. 
And then, then we try to write an account. Uh, is there ever a perfect account of anything? <clears throat> Probably not. Um, but we do our best to try to put the different viewpoints together to suggest what might have happened. That approach might make it easier to bring in the accounts that we yeah. can't explain right. because yeah, we're, not, exactly. uh, we're not explaining them. Yeah. Good. Uh, once you join me, thank you.